May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. I often uh, reference the fact that we as human beings learn by seeing and imitating others. And the clearest example, uh, I always think, is little children learning how to walk. Because they see the, the mischief that their big brothers and sisters get into and they go, ooh, that looks like fun, and they try and copy them. So this is, now, that's not just little babies, that's, that's an ongoing process. And sometimes it's a very good thing. You know, if, you, um, if you're a big fan, say, of, of um, football and you, you have, a, you have a, a star that you watch and you admire and you take on their training regime, great, wonderful. Uh, sometimes it works slightly less well. This, is, this seems to be so built into what it means to be a human being. Uh, anthropologists sometimes argue that this is the defining mo sort of criteria of what it means to be a human being, is the way we imitate others. Now, there is sometimes, in a sense, a bit of a dark side to that. Uh, and once again, I'm going to use children as the analogy, but please don't think it just applies to children, it's just the clearest. Uh, if you go to a childcare centre, you know, you might be dropping children or grandchildren off or, or something like that, uh, and there is one ball, and there is four children, what that is, is a recipe for World War Three. <laughs> It's a pile of them. Uh, it's, it's, now, that's quite normal. And if you think it doesn't apply to adults, there's a website you may have heard of. If you're going to go to a, somewhere and you're looking for a hotel called What If? Yeah, you've heard of What If? Yep. One of the things they do is, this hotel has just been booked. This room has just been sold. We sold four of these. Now, that might be factually correct. But the reason they put it on the website is because people go, Ooh, somebody else booked that hotel. It must be a good hotel. <laughs> we do it. I mean, they do it to adults because they know it works. Now it's fine if you book in a hotel and all the rest of it. Uh, it becomes a bit more problematic uh, when, when it's more than that. It becomes problematic when it becomes things like... Uh, the resources of the earth, you know? It becomes problematic when it becomes, I want all the stuff. And I know I want stuff because other people want the stuff, whatever it might be, food, gold, technology, money, it doesn't matter. And it becomes very, it drives that kind of acquisitive nature in our society. It drives the desire to have more and more and more and more. And we need to learn to break that cycle. Well, not break it, because we can't, because we're human. But we at least need to learn to moderate it and stop and ask ourselves the question, do I really, really need that fourth Rolls Royce? <laughs> Let's be honest, if you've got up to four Rolls Royces, the answer is no. <laughs> but we, we sometimes need to ask ourselves that question regardless. Now, one of the things that people will compete for one of the things that people will compete for is the attention of their parents. Siblings will do this. Sometimes you'll have a good sibling, the good child. In my experience, they're often the sister. <laughs> I'm not saying that's always the case. And they're the good one. And they get the attention by being the good child. And then you get the one that's the problem. In my experience, it's the sister's older brother. <laughs> you know, the, the one who's like, oh, what are we going to do about you, Andrew? Oh, yeah, I'll help you. That's attention. That's, that's exactly what I wanted. Sorry, the, the metaphorical older brother. <laughs> it becomes a problem when it becomes too competitive, when it becomes destructive. Now, there's a couple of solutions to that. There's the solution that the cranky parent does. You both want the ball, you're fighting over it. Yoik! Ball's gone. My ball now. 
It's in the cupboard. That's one solution. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, as a parent, it's one I've pulled more than once. <laughs> uh, and it, we do it. We do it. Uh, it doesn't work quite so well when you're dealing with, say, countries who are fighting over oil wells. Sorry, freedom. Um, but it's a solution. There is another solution, though. There is the solution that says, at the moment you're fighting because you think there's a limited amount of resources. Our world has told you that there is not enough resources. As a loving parent, I have the option to, one, first introduce you to the idea that there is enough. So, balls, childcare, kindergarten, coming back to that. You all want a ball? Okay. Yeah, you can all have a ball now. Very quickly, none of the kids are interested in a ball anymore. Because they were interested only because the other people were interested. But the first step, and this is the step that uh, Jesus points us to here, is there is enough. You don't have to fight for the Father's attention. You don't have to compete with anyone else for the bread that comes from heaven. There is enough. And at that very moment, Christ short-circuits one of the things that drives so much sin and pain in the world by telling us there's enough. However, if you want your kindergarten children to grow up to be good adults, the second step to that is to go, okay, have you noticed now that you were, you're no longer fighting over the walls? In fact, Three of the balls are over in the corner, and you're playing soccer. That's the one of the... yeah, soccer. Uh, there's the conversation that helps us grow up and learn to moderate ourselves. Second step. And Christ has that with us. It is written in the prophets that will all be taught by God. We can see this, and we can be led into truth. Final step. So, when you had one ball, and you made the decision to play a game together, didn't that work really well? When you have enough resources, and yet you choose to come together to worship God, didn't that work really well? Don't we build community by recognizing that there is power in the sharing of the resources we have. And so we come to a very different gathering experience. We come to the experience where we as a community gather around the resources that God gives to us and we share them. And, and we call it the Eucharist. And uh, I could probably preach on the Eucharist every Sunday for the rest of my life, and I still wouldn't have got to the bottom of it. But we call it the Eucharist, where we gather and we share what God has given us. Not because God doesn't have spare, but because we have learned that there is goodness in this. Now, there's this idea that what we do in church is supposed to be a reflection both of what it means to be in heaven and it's supposed to affect the way we live our lives on a daily basis beyond uh, the walls of this building. If it doesn't affect that, it's pointless. If it doesn't reflect what it means to be a part of God's kingdom, it's pointless. I believe the impact that we have on the world is through the wisdom of saying there is a great gift in us choosing to share our resources. Choosing to do that and thus creating community. It's not about giving away, it's about creating community by the sharing of what we have. Because that's what Christ showed us in this place. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.